Today, the sermon title is Emmanuel, God with us. Have you noticed the different ways that people relate to God and the many ways there are to include God in your life? Do you feel God is with you? Is there a better way to live? Imagine life with God continually. Here's Pastor Mark. Uh, as, as Christians, we have this thing we say, and we talk about having a relationship with God and, and how God just wants to have a relationship with you. Uh, and it seems like there's all sorts of ways that people tend to relate to God. Um, it's not just one way. And, and I read this book um, this year uh, called With by a man named Sky Jathani. And it was uh, it kind of rocked my world a little bit. Um, it got me thinking more than any book that I've, I've read this year. Um, and, uh, and he had kind of four points that I wanted to go over in that book uh, about the different ways that we relate to God. Uh, first is uh, life under God. Uh, this is essentially a bartering system. This is the idea of the formula if then. Uh, if you do blank, then God will do blank. And you fill that in. If you go to church, you're a good person, you give money, you, you volunteer your time, uh, you come on Christmas Eve service, you're, you're signed up to pray at 4 a.m. for somebody, you do justice, you, you save yourself sexually for marriage, uh, you take your wife out every week on a date, sorry, babe. Um, <laughs> Whatever it is, you do this, and then God will do something for you. He'll make, uh, he'll make sure that you get married or that you have a great marriage. Uh, he'll give you a job or a promotion. He'll take care of you. He'll make something happen for you. If you do this, God will do blank. Uh, the problem with this is, is people that live this way, um, they tend to uh, abandon God when tragedy strikes. We have this, this weird uh, sense of entitlement that uh, because of the things I did, God owes me, right? You think, hey, you know, I go to church at least twice a month. I have to sit through Seth all the time. God, you owe me, right? I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I, get to, I get to watch Seth on YouTube every week. It's one of the greatest days of my life. Um, but seriously, we feel like, God, you, you owe me for the things that I've done, uh, this, this entitlement, this is life under God. Second way we relate to God is, is life over God. These are people, when it comes to relationship with God, uh, they want what they want. We can, we can kind of think of this as, as a form of secularism, which is kind of the, the de facto religion in, in America today, in, in Western Europe. Um, it's this idea, and it's not atheism, because you can be a Christian, and you can go to church on Sunday, or, or a Muslim, or a Jew. The secular meaning of your life um, is that God just has nothing really to do with your day-to-day life. The idea is that he's just kind of on the periphery, but when you need him, then you better show up. The idea is that the center of your life is, is you or your body or your career or your love life, whatever it is, and God just kind of is somewhere out there. Another way we do this, and, and it's this weird kind of form of Christianity that is really pervasive because it sounds so good, it's the idea of, of biblical principles for living. We've all seen these books on the shelves. Um, it's five steps to have a fantastic marriage. Or it's four ways to raise picture-perfect kids that go to college and never get DUIs or whatever it is. Which actually, I think I want to read that book. Um, uh, or here are five steps to, th- to absolutely thrive in your career or, or to maximize your, your whatever it is. And, and underneath it is this weird, subtle, kind of messed up way that we come to God, and it, almost as if we're, we're manipulating him to get what we want. The third way that we relate to God uh, is life from God. And, and I want to take a minute or two maybe on this one, uh, because for my generation, I think this is the one that we typically fall into the most. Uh, this is where... We're more interested in what we can get from God than from who God is himself. Not very long ago, a, a sociologist uh, in Chapel Hill, in North Carolina, um, he had just wrapped up years of research on, on teenagers and, and young 20-somethings. Uh, his name's Christian Smith. Uh, and he found out what he believed is the way that we view God. And uh, basically, his, uh, his findings came to this, and this is his quote. Uh, We view God as a combination divine butler and cosmic therapist. And then he goes on to quote, The central goal of life is to be happy 
and to feel good about oneself. And if we really think about it, uh, that is so kind of American, right? The pursuit of happiness, um, which is an awesome movie by, with Will Smith. Uh, I definitely recommend it. Um, but the idea of it for our own life, um, he called it this moralistic therapeutic deism uh, was the term that he coined for it. Uh, and basically, that's what he thinks of as Christianity. Because the majority of the people that he interviewed said, I'm a Christian, and this is what I believe. Uh, moralistic, meaning uh, being a good person. Therapeutic, uh, meaning um, that coming to God makes you feel happy inside. You get joy and peace. Uh, and then, yeah, there's a God there, but he's not really involved unless I need something. And this is basically how millions upon millions of young and old Americans do relationship with God. I mean, we are born into this, this very consumeristic culture. Uh, the air we breathe, everything around us is goods and, and services for us to consume. Uh, we remember this in a very cute way at Christmas, don't we? And we, we carry this consumeristic worldview, uh, and it becomes uh, part of church, as, as religious goods and services, and you and I become spiritual consumers of God, of church, the Bible, whatever it is, where the end goal is to get life from God. To borrow from a, a Christian analogy, we're more interested in the gift than the giver himself. Uh, Sky wrote that uh, so many of our contemporary religious beliefs are, are focused on God's gifts rather than on God. Uh, we use God's as a, a mean of building or repairing relationships or family. We use him as our, our marriage therapist. He's our political advisor, our financial planner. Uh, from God's hand, we seek sex, money, power, fame, wealth. Uh, but do we actually want God himself? We shouldn't find it uh, surprising to find that we fixate on what we can attain from God rather than to experience the peace from his presence in our lives. Number four, uh, we have life for God. And this is kind of the exact opposite of life from God. It's the advocate for social justice, the activist, and the nonprofit social entrepreneur or the missionary. These are men and women who fight, sleep, labor, bleed, and burn out as they cross the finish line, half dead already. All for the mission of God. And I'm not against the mission of God. I'm very much for the mission of our church here, and I love God to death. Uh, but there's such thing as too much. When the mission of God eclipses the God who's on the mission, that's a recipe for burnout. Burnout in your own soul. And secondly, it's kind of a, a bit of a screwed up way to relate to the God who started it all. So we have under, over, from, for, these are kind of the four main ways we tend to relate to God. Um, and, and not all uh, that, but kind of interesting enough, as we think about Christmas time and, and our neighbors and our friends and the family that we're going to see, this is actually the way that we tend to relate to people as well. Uh, if we live under others, these are people pleasers. Uh, we want everybody to like us. We're nice and fun and kind of encouraging. Uh, this is me in a nutshell. Uh, and we kind of expect you to like us but then we can't handle criticism. Or we live over others, where the end goal is, is command or control or, or manipulate even. Uh, maybe you're kind of bossy or domineering or you're a little bit manipulative or sly, uh, but either way, it's life over others. Or perhaps it's in life from others, where we come into relationships kind of like shopping, where we judge people by the worth they have to us. And of course, there's life for others, we're all about the, the people of God, uh, but we view relationships as a task to accomplish rather than human beings enjoy life with. So again, we have over and under, from and for. Uh, these are the ways we relate to God and others. But is there a better way? Is there a framework for a better way to live? And uh, obviously, I believe the answer is yes. And so now we're going to look at the Bible and see what it says. Uh, we're starting Matthew chapter 1. Uh, if you're new to scriptures, that is A-OK. -okay. Uh, Matthew is one of four first century autobiographies about Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, we're going to start off in verse 18 of chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law 
and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to his son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to his son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. This is one of the greatest stories uh, I think we have in the Bible. Uh, this is the story of Jesus' birth. And, and the word we want to look at is Emmanuel, or God with us. Uh, if you don't know, um, this is actually uh, a prophecy. The, the, the saying of Emmanuel, or what's taking place here, happened in Isaiah 700 years prior to Jesus being born. Um, this was a very turmoil striving time for the, uh, for the Israelites, for the Jewish people. Uh, they are literally about to be taken over by the Syrian army. Everything is going to be wiped out. They're freaked out. And God, through Isaiah, comes to them and says, do not worry, I'm with you. The sign that you'll have is Emmanuel, the virgin birth. And a lot of times when we think of the story of Jesus and and Jesus being born, uh, we think of it in, in one of two ways. Uh, number one, it's that God came, that Jesus was born and he came. He's with us in flesh. And that is 100% absolutely, totally true. Jesus is the embodiment of the creator God. But there's another way to look at this as well. Meaning that Jesus is with us as not an aloof, deistic, impersonal God, but like the Israelites, when they're about to be taken by the Syrian army, he's with us even during the difficult, hard times in our lives. When Jesus showed up in this scandalous way with this young teenage girl, he was saying, I am with you always, 100% of the time. In fact, the whole Bible preaches of the withness of God. That's a new word. I'm going to give that one to you for free. <clears throat> Think of, think of Genesis. We have Adam and Eve in the garden, and they get to walk in the cool of the day with God. Could you imagine the withness of God? All the questions you could ask. Adam and Eve are probably the smartest people in the whole wide world. And then we look at Revelation, the very end of the Bible, chapter 21. Uh, it says, the dwelling place of God is now among the people. This is the future, and he will dwell with them. They'll be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. In the middle between Genesis and Revelation, we see God and his witness, both through the promises he made to Abraham, through the life of the Israelites, and finally coming crashing down when he became a baby born in that manger through Jesus. The witness of God. It's incredible. What this looks like for us, well, I uh, sometimes, believe it or not, um, have a bad day at work, um, and, uh, and I'll be driving home in my truck, uh, or like this last week, you know, it was raining. Uh, I literally uh, stomped on trash in the dumpster in the pouring rain, uh, not my brightest moment, um, but, you know, I'm driving home, and it's raining, and I'm tired, and I'm hungry, and I just want a warm shower and some food, uh, and I walk in the door, and I just hear this little gasp, <gasps> Daddy's home. And Charlotte comes running to me and just wraps me up in this big bear hug. And she just has this idea of withness figured out, right? She just wanted to be with her daddy. Which begs the question from God, well, why does he want to be with his creation? What is it about us or about him that makes him want to have this relationship with us? And, and I'm sure there's lots of reasons. Uh, but one is God, by nature, is just a relational being. Uh, I think the Gospel of John, the opening line uh, in his version of the Christmas story, he does this very uh, poetic, theologically rich start. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, that's his name for Jesus, was with God, and the Word 
was God. The idea is that all of creation literally sprung out from the relational nature of who God is. That from the very beginning of time and space, we've been modeled what perfect, wonderful relationship looks like through the Trinity. Uh, and now, because of the Christmas story, you and I are invited to be a part of that relationship, straight into the relational nature of God himself. And it's not just a promise. <clears throat> this is what God, uh, this just means that God, sorry, let's start over. <clears throat> straight into the relationship nature of God himself, for surely I am with you, is not just a promise. There it is. Um, but when God says always, if you study the Greek, if you go to seminary school and you learn this, you learn this one key point that always means always. <clears throat> That's a free education for you. Um, he's always with you. It's 24-7. Good health, sick, disease, cancer, blessing, prosperity, unemployment, promotions, loneliness, family. God is with you. That promise is also an invitation. It's God's way of saying, listen, I'm with you, are you with me? I'm relational by nature. Are you going to join me in relationship now? So if you haven't figured it out yet, the better way to live is life with God. In the four ways of relating to God, they're, they're not all bad. There's a little bit of truth in each one. Of course, we get life from God. Of course, we live life for God. Of course, biblical principles aren't a bad thing in and of themselves, but they're getting at something much greater. All four of these see relationship uh, with God as a mean to an end, but in reality, God as we know him should be the end. God himself is the point. Relationship with him. Last week, I was uh, making Charlotte some lunch, um, as I do from time to time. And, and I was working in the kitchen, and in the kitchen, it's, you know, everything's hot, and, and she can't touch it, and it's sharp, and it's off limits. It, it's basically a death trap for toddlers, as far as parents are concerned. Uh, and, and she comes in the kitchen, and, uh, and she says, Daddy, can you come play with me? Um, and, and I'm in the middle of, you know, using fire, very manly, cooking food, a nice quesadilla. And... Uh, <laughs> And it's time for her lunch, um, and, and I'm not a monster, so I said, you know, you know, Daddy's making you lunch. Uh, can you go play by yourself for a minute? And, and if, you're, if you're good, um, I'll give you a little treat after lunch. And, and I'm expecting her to be like, oh, sweet, you know, and peace out. Um, <clears throat> but instead, she says, Daddy, I don't want a treat. I just want you to hold me and be with me. Oh. Now, I doubt that's actually true. <clears throat> <laughs> but in that moment, I thought to myself, kid, I'm going to hold you forever, right? <clears throat> because in that moment, she'd rather just be with me to be held or, or for the two of us to play together and chat and laugh than to get a chocolate or a fruit snack or whatever it is. She'd rather be with me. And, and I think that's kind of the heart and soul of, of relationship, right, of being with. To God, to, to others, your sons, your daughters, moms, dads, your friends, your boyfriend, your coworker, your neighbor. It's all about with. It's all about God with you. Imagine a world where, where I related to Charlotte uh, in a different way. In one of those four ways that I talked about earlier. If it was, if it was life under. Uh, now, I'm not going to lie. Uh, sometimes I do uh, incentivize life for Charlotte. <clears throat> Uh, and, and recently, Charlotte got to be the flower girl in, in one of Jessica's friend's wedding. And, uh, and she was gorgeous and amazing. And she walked down that aisle. But the idea of her sitting still for an entire wedding in the front row uh, just was not going to happen. Uh, so enter a entire thing of M&Ms. Uh, and, and by the end of the wedding, she sat quietly but just was dripping in chocolate. <laughs> and I was totally okay with it. <laughs> But if that's the soul of mine and Charlotte's interactions, um, I'm just a, a candy dispenser for her good behavior, right? Or if it's life over and, and it's Charlotte, you know, she comes down in the morning and she's sitting on the couch and she's, hey, turn the TV on, Daddy, and get me a snack, Daddy. No, I don't want that one, Daddy. Get me a different one. And halfway through the show, she's like, I don't like this show. Change the show. And Daddy, 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 Daddy. Do you see the problem with that? 
or perhaps if it's uh, life from, what, what would it look like if, if I wanted to spend time with Charlotte, but uh, only if she could do something for me, right? I'd have to kick her out of the house till she was 10 and could do some yard work, right? <clears throat> That's life from. Um, and then there's life for, and, you know, Charlotte has uh, been kind of having some health issues lately, and we're trying to figure out what's wrong with her, and uh, she's been such a trooper, and she's been all these doctors, and she had to give blood, and she's doing all these tests, and we don't know exactly what's wrong with her yet for sure. Um, but more than anything, I just want to put her in a bubble and keep her from the world so that she can be safe and healthy. But that's not fair, right? It's not fair to her to experience life that way. But what about with? Well, with is, is just being a daddy. We have this, uh, this innate ability built into us as fathers where we throw our kids in the air. We just can't help ourselves. And I, I think it's instinctual, really. Um, and, and one time I was throwing her, and I threw her just a little bit too high for her comfort level <clears throat> and not quite high enough for a record. Um, <clears throat> But she let out this little gasp slash whimper, right? To this little, you know. Uh, and I caught her, and she had a tear in her eye. Um, and, and I'm holding her. I said, Charlotte, are you okay? And she says to me, and, and I kid you not, uh, she says, yeah, because daddy's always got me. That's Emmanuel, right? That's God with us. That's the kind of relationship that he's looking for to have with us, where we know 100% of the time that our Father in heaven has always got us. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity as we celebrate your birthday to come here together as family. Lord, I pray as uh, we go out into the day that uh, we just experience life and relationship with each other, Lord and we experience life and relationship with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.